Uh, hi, my name is Susan Wu. I'm in cloud networking. I'm a product manager. And so here we're talking about making Kubernetes simpler for accelerated workloads. I have this like, uh, steam panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Go ahead first. Testing. Hey, cool. Works. Um, so I'm Aditya. I work as a product manager at Crusoe. Crusoe Cloud, I guess. Um, what we do is we're an EI cloud, but we co-locate our data centers next to stranded, wasted, or sustainable energy sources. So we do some interesting things with energy and the way we power our cloud. Um, yeah, I, I manage sort of our platform services and orchestration there. And before this, I spent a bunch of time at AWS building out sort of serverless compute at Lambda, and then a couple other companies before that. Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm a senior software engineer at Uber, who I think uh, most of you are familiar with. If you took an Uber here, thanks for keeping me in the job. Uh, I run uh, and work on a stateless compute platform called Up, which we have uh, 3 million CPU cores behind. And that runs everywhere from uh, the most ba the uh, trip serving apps for web applications all the way, all the way through to uh, AI workloads and accelerated workloads, everything that is effectively stateless. Uh, and yeah. Hi, I'm Rebecca Weekly. I run infrastructure engineering at Geico. And you might wonder what that means at Geico. We have six data centers. We have eight different clouds. Uh, so it is actually the hybrid cloud footprint across all of our infrastructure needs to support our business. Hey, I'm Mitch Bikhezi. I'm a site reliability engineer at uh, Weave Communications. And uh, we, uh, we're a software company. We sell a small uh, software to small to medium sized businesses to uh, help them run their offices. So primarily focused on, you know, dental offices, optometrists, uh, you know, vet type offices. And um, yeah, we're, we're sort of like in the early stages of building out our uh, ML platform and, and uh, running workloads on accelerators and, and Kates. So we, uh, Mitch had to travel in, but his company is headquartered where? Lehigh, <laughs> 45 minutes south. <laughs> So OK, let's get dive right in. So you know, this session is all about platform engineers. And so for the platform engineers that we have in this very panel, do you generally offer Kubernetes for conventional software development and then add AI? Or do you have dedicated teams for AI? And uh, I'm going to start with Lucy on that one. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I work on our stateless compute platform, and we offer Kubernetes and uh, effectively service, de service deployment to all the teams across Uber who want to do any sort of state stateless workloads. So that can be anything from um, web applications such as the Uber website uh, through, through to uh, internal report generators, and including in that as well uh, AI workloads as accelerated workloads on top. So that could be anything from inference uh, workloads that are running in production and that are critical to production working, uh, over to training, where people are training models for all sorts of uh, internal use cases inside of Uber. And then uh, we set we segment we segment out that uh, what is it we have a self serve application and applica and the service owners come to us and they uh, say oh I need this specific hardware that may be uh, unconventional and then our system autonomously then places them onto that hardware for most folks then it kind of hides the complexity because they just don't request the resource and they don't have to care but it means that we can keep this all in one platform and not have to rebuild the wheel just because it's machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, others can chime in as well. How about uh, a D a Crusoe? Do they have dedicated teams? or well, I'm thinking you do because it's an ML. Yeah, we run a cloud, so I think we, we have a dedicated platform team. I think the interesting bit, at least the I think the observation that we have had, we obviously work with a bunch of customers, and they kind of vary. Like there's a lot of sort of AI native companies that, you know, their whole sort of business is sort of training and serving models, and so their their layout is very different. But when we sort of worked with enterprises and work with companies that are kind of figuring out that journey. I think it's an interesting transition where you have, you know, typically you know, a lot of the sort of data science and ML workloads have sort of been handled by the research divisions, the research teams that are sort of pushing the boundaries and what you can do, right? So you have companies that really focus on that. But then with AI just becoming more prevalent as, as a workload for a lot of different companies, I think the, that responsibility is shifting to just sort of general platform teams or general infrastructure teams that are required to learn how to sort of host, manage, and deploy these models in production. And so I think there's a, I, I know we're going to talk about it more. I think there's a lot of challenges that those teams have to sort of figure out as they learn about these workloads and about sort of optimizing the infrastructure that they run on, preventing sort of cluster sprawl, all of those interesting things. Right? What about Geico? What happens there? 
Sure. So we have a platform team that focuses, like I said, from an infrastructure perspective on Kubernetes, it's sort of vended compute and storage below. And we try very hard to make sure they don't need to think about which of those many clouds is how or where things are scheduled. They just get to focus on the application development. ML and AI are the fun children in all of these problems, right? Just like our data teams before, um, or the research teams before that. They always want a very specific kind of configuration. And of course, Kubernetes tends to lend itself really well to cattle and not particularly well to pets. Um, that being said, there's a lot of great opportunities that are coming out to really ensure that Kubernetes is not just being used as a container orchestration platform, but truly as an infrastructure management layer. And that's where we've seen all the opportunities, whether you're using Kubeflow or you know, something that is more vended and managed for you, like a data robot. Those are going to give you a very consistent data pipeline integration with a lot of the different models for the experimentation folks but they also give you the ability to have much better open telemetry exporters, much more consistency across clouds, so that you can start to optimize once they are done with their tuning and playing in whatever version of cloud they want to work in, you can start to optimize internally and say, okay, it looks like we have deterministic load, this is how we're gonna do this particular workload over time, and we can start to look at opportunities to optimize it. I think we covered that question pretty well. Uh, Mitch, let me uh, ask you, I, we have this eye chart, but uh, what kind of customizations have you made to Kubernetes? Are there any adjacent open source projects that you had to implement for this workload? Yeah, so, uh, we, so we adopted Kubernetes like, I don't know, two years after it came out. So we've spent a lot of time investing in our platform that we've built on top of it, uh, mostly because we want to protect developers from the complexities of Kubernetes, not to throw shade on Kubernetes at a Kubernetes conference. But um, yeah, that was like the major, major motivator. So um, yeah, like our approach uh, to running accelerated workloads is just to keep it really simple and lean into all of the tooling that we ha already have built out that our developers know how to use. And um, that really gives them, that, that really allows them to be, um, to, to move quickly, right, and deliver value to our customers faster. And so, um, yeah, our, our answer to running accelerators is just, you know, use core cates. We're using the, the core kube scheduler. Um, we're just using node affinity, you know, uh, node taints and, and, and pod tolerations to get your, your pods placed in the right place. Um, some open source things that we're using, uh, Kata for scaling, because, you know, most likely you won't be able to scale, you know, on the traditional things like CPU or even accelerator usage. Uh, so you'll most likely need some sort of like custom metrics that you want to scale on. So Kata is definitely one that we brought in uh, to replace uh, HPA in our old um, Prometheus adapter that we were, we were using to pull uh, custom metrics with before. Um, and then uh, I like metrics. So DCGM exporter is good for knowing how your accelerators are doing. So um, that's deployed as a daemon set. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of our, the open source uh, pieces that we're using. Yeah, it seems like you touched on a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, Aditya, you're a PM, so as you're building out the platform, I'm sure you've added a lot of the adjacent open source projects into your platform. Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess we're sort of, what a lot of our customers do when they sort of come on our cloud, the first thing they obviously do is deploy Kubernetes, because that tends to be the standard way you tend to interact with infrastructure, especially when you're operating across multiple clouds, like a lot of our customers do. And then I think it's, I think it very much depends on uh, you know, how you want to sort of submit jobs. And there are obviously standard pieces. So things like sort of monitoring, you typically go through DCGM exporter, you set up your sort of Kube Prometheus and Grafana, and like however you choose to visualize your metrics, right? Um, as far, I think the biggest piece of customization that a lot of our customers do is around the scheduler and the scheduling logic. Um, so you have some customers who use something like Q. Um, Ray is really popular. I think especially as you, especially for, a lot of our customers tend to operate in this pattern where they, you know, you have clusters across multiple clouds and then you have typically a parent cluster that's like orchestrating jobs across multiple child clusters that are sitting in provi like providers like us or in like other sort of GPU clouds or in like GCP or AWS, pick, pick your cloud, right? Um, and so sort of setting up that logic, I think there's been a bunch of interesting talks around doing that with Q and doing that with like, I think Skyday was a talk that happens. So yeah, that, that pattern of deploying that and customizing your cluster so they sort of receive and sort of handle sort of AI jobs well, I think is primarily what we see a lot of customers do. Uber, I think there's some things you can't talk to, but without there, getting... There, so there is. <laughs> Disclose what you can. Yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so, um, what is it? Uh, 
one of the things that I think is quite interesting in the space with customizing on K8 and what K8 has been weak at until recently is dealing with the fact that certain workloads want certain hardware and that that, and that, that hardware may be slightly specialized in some ways. Back when Kubernetes was initially built, uh, I think uh, met, met quite a few years ago, I think some of you folks were probably around then, uh, a lot more of our uh, hardware was quite commoditized. We all used either Ace x86 or AMD64, for example, looking at anything. We all just used like a GPU. No one really, well, some people did, but not many people really cared about what hardware they're on. But now you look at machine learning, and it's kind of the tip of the iceberg on this. And with machine learning in particular, of course, it's like you use a different, uh, use a different GPU, you get much better training results. Uh, but also, these GPUs are really, really expensive. But this applies also to loads of other things I see. I have folks with GPUs coming to me saying, you know, I need to be on this H100 or my model is going to suck. But I also even have people like saying, I want, to, I want my uh, program to be running on ARM because it's cheaper and it's more efficient. And I think it's like that the whole industry seems to be swinging back this way. Um, that before, and this is part of why in Kubernetes, it's like we just had, before DRA, we just had memory and CPU. And like, what CPU? A CPU somewhere. Who knows what Arch it is? Who knows what it is? And now, and now you actually, you care a lot about what that one is. And luckily, Kubernetes is getting better at supporting that. Um, so, for example, with DRA and things that I think people should be using very liberally. Uh, the other issue we have, which didn't used to be much of a thing, particularly back when hardware was much more, I guess, commoditized and more generic, was that people really care about squeezing every last cent out of, out of expensive hardware. You know, back back in previous times, it was like, oh, I could run my cluster at like 80% capacity. And it's like, oh, cool, whatever, you know, good enough. Now it's like I get engineers come to me with H100s and say like, I want to use every single one of these all the time. I don't want a single H100 to be idle. It is just a massive money sink if I do that. And so for that in particular, we start we are using uh, different uh, schedulers. So for example, we're doing a lot of bin packing to avoid resource fragmentation. So you know, if you've got a node with like, a, if you've got 100 nodes, each with eight, G, eight GPUs, all of them used, using seven GPUs, and then you need to schedule a new workload that needs two GPUs, you can't do it. So we found much, we've actually found it much more successful for uh, uh, using the maximum resources in our clusters when we have been bin packing. We found it much better than the traditional scheduler. Not to throw shade on the traditional scheduler, it's great for most cases and most generic cases, but particularly when you have expensive hardware, bin packing, I think, is a really easy thing you can do to squeeze a bit more out of them. A uh, show of hands, how many folks are using the GPUs uh, and a, a few out there? Anyone using the TPUs? Not so far. Oh, oh, there's one out there. Okay. Anyone using the ARM that uh, processors that? Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Got a good mix of everything. <laughs> okay. Um, did anyone else want to weigh in? I, I also want to have a follow-up question on you know like how did you choose those specialized compute actually? Like, is there a criteria that you look for? Is there a region? Or is it availability? Uh, what What do you use to uh, choose those? Make those choices. Yeah. yeah, so uh, initially uh, we don't have strong uh, preferences for what GPUs, so it's, uh, so like I, I touched on uh, node affinity, so we're using, uh, we're, we're weighting the node affinity towards the cheaper GPUs, so like the T4s, uh, and then the L4s, and then the V100s is, are the three that we're, we're targeting. And so, um, yeah, uh, you know, FinOps cost savings is a, is a big part of, uh, you know, kind of the, the platform team at Weave um, that we like to, to keep our eye on and make sure that we keep our costs low, so. Um, that's a big criteria. So availability, <laughs> ability to run the model is probably the number one and two concerns that have happened from an enterprise perspective over the last year and a half as everyone's thought about and gotten excited about generative AI. Um, so that actually I think has led to a state where we are thinking about this from the data perspective first, even before the hardware. I love hardware. but. Even before the hardware, you got to start with where is my data that I want to train upon? Can I actually do or leverage this model, that model? Do we know is it deterministic, right? So how do we create the right experimentation opportunities to unlock business value and then think through, okay, great. We need to be doing this at the right cost structures to actually deliver value to our business. So separating the experimentation flows into the actual infrastructure design choices and then using methodologies like Kubernetes running on top so that you have uh, the ability to move things much more easily because 
AI, we keep talking about it, it's just one phase of a pipeline. We can't, <laughs> we need all the data there to be able to do the work effectively. And that's why you want it to be as close to those end states as possible. Aditya, do you have a mixed environment, like current generation GPU and then future? Uh, yeah, talk about that, because I was in the queue, and they were saying you could put resources and label the GPU generations. Yeah, I mean, we obviously offer a, a mix of GPUs, you know, and, and I think we're at an interesting point with the kind of hardware treadmill that's going on right now. So you obviously have, obviously dominated by NVIDIA, and you have the H200s coming out, and you have the sort of Blackwell generation that's sort of starting to peak in. Right? And so, Interesting point where, you know, traditionally, you, you sort of GPUs are primarily driven by like availability, right? It's just where can I find GPUs and I'm going to use them, right? Now, I think especially with a lot of the older generations, um, you know, A100s and even maybe you not know, L40Ss aren't traditionally old, but like I think you're starting to see availability sort of pop up there as well. I think so there are opportunities for people to sort of, especially with inference, I'll say. We spoke a lot about training, but with inference, I think there's, you know, once you've trained your model, there are lots of optimizations that you can do. I think there's specifically for, it comes down to your use case, right? For your use case, you're kind of trading off against throughput and sort of responsiveness, right? So how latency sensitive do you want your model to be? Can I sort of, you know, batch, sort of batch the, you know, the data that I'm kind of feeding into the model to sort of optimize its utilization? Um, can I optimize the model through quantization and other techniques right, to get them to fit on specific sort of chips and then take advantage of those to improve your price performance? Right? That's what we see a lot of our customers doing successfully, right? um, especially when taking advantage of chips. Like even, even if you look at you know, AMD, for example, with their MI300Xs, right, a lot of where they're trying to go after the market is around inference right, with a sort of larger, larger sort of VRAM on the GPUs to fit these models and accommodate more models in a single GPU. So you're able to sort of squeeze more utilization out of it. So I think that's what a lot of the opportunity is, right? Um, as far as taking advantage of older generations of specific hardware. Let me ask a follow-up question. Is where do you run your GPUs? Is it in the cloud? Is it on-prem? Uh, Rebecca, did you have a viewpoint? Both. <laughs> uh, for that reason, right? Yeah. Because if you want people to experiment, you want them to experiment in a cloud. That's generally a better spot. I don't have any optimization. I mean, I do, but it's more in the zone of VM dimming and things that are easier to implement without creating you know, churn for my users. When it comes to unlocking, you know, AI, ML is core to the business, right? Insurance is a rate to risk model. It is a data business. That is what we do. However well we price risk, we make money. If we don't price it well, we lose money. That's it. That's the business. And so we've been doing AI and ML and experimenting in this domain for a very long time, but maybe not with the generative AI mentality that has become so exciting. When you're a regulated industry, you have to be able to describe to everyone why you came to that assessment of risk for that individual in that zone at that time with that vehicle. So you have to have something that humans and auditors can rationalize about. So it doesn't really lend itself to hallucination. So we don't really want to play that game, right? We want to be very deterministic when it comes to how we run our core business. When it comes to generative AI, that's about productivity of our people. And how do we make sure we're actually enabling our developers to move more quickly? How are we enabling our agents to work across systems, understand compliance rules in the region that they're in, work across state lines so that they don't have to be an expert in that region only? All of those factors that can make a human better. And that's where, if it's not perfectly accurate, there's still time to fix it. And there's a human interpreting the results to ensure that they are accurate and effective. And so it's the time to efficacy for an agent. It's the time to be able to get back and be excellent at our jobs and excellent at giving service to our end users. So those are very different parts of the stack. Right? One's my core business and you know, a set of data that we're going to extract and analyze 10 to the 14 parameters around rate to risk. That is running on-prem. That is well understood. That is constantly being optimized. We're running new models against it and tuning on new data as we get new data. And it is 60% plus cheaper to do it there than anywhere else. 
if I go and look at ways in which we're playing with generative AI and trying to look at what might be interesting for an agent assist platform, yeah, we're going to do that in the cloud. We're going to play over there. We're going to figure out what's right. And then we'll decide this is a part of the core business. It needs to be. It's mostly going to be an inference. We'll stay that part in the cloud. And then what we need to do, if we really need to train it on specific data that is regulated, we would keep that from a data like security perspective on-prem. So it really comes down to the same factors, but just thinking through our security model, what is core to the business, what do we want to have that is differentiated, and then where are the users and the eyeballs and the low latency scenarios or the experimentation that would make us want to be more in the cloud? Yeah, that makes sense. Trust and safety are like one of the key criteria for selection. Okay, now it's time for folks to get on the get on the microphone and ask questions. Like, I think uh, about six months ago, I did this panel and a lot of folks were just getting into this and now this this uh, at this conference there are like tons of sessions on AI so I, I'm thinking some folks are already out in the audience already deploying Kubernetes clusters uh, building abstractions for you know data scientists research scientists but are there folks that have questions on how to get into this uh, feel free to go to the microphone uh, you know and, and ask your questions because I, I think it's, uh, uh, I've been meeting a lot of platform engineers. They sort of gradually get into it. Uh, they were providing conventional Kubernetes for applications, and then suddenly they got drafted. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Sarko. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for sharing your uh, perspectives. I asked this question with a few other uh, attendees as well, but I would like to hear your perspective on this. Large language models, large in size. We would like to cache it in blob storage. But then when we want to serve it, we have to create a copy of it in your clusters locally. And then we would also like to auto scale it across multiple nodes or multiple GPUs. So how do you make sure that uh, you, know, you bring this right performance and be able to serve uh, at an optimal pace? Do you serve it from the blob storage? Do you download it from the blob storage every time a new pod is created? What has been your experience? Yeah, we, we cheated a little bit. Um, in that regard, because uh, so we're, I don't know if you're running in, in GKE. Uh, Azure. You do? Azure. Oh, Azure, okay. You could be any Kubernetes, yeah, so, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> like we, uh, we, we're dealing with really large container sizes, right, if you, depending on how you build your containers, but um, this is a solved problem. So you'll need some sort of like prefetch mechanism. Um, and so in GKE, it's a solved problem that they solved about three years ago. They have container image streaming. And so when we ran into like slow, Pod startup times. Uh, a lot of that was downloading the container image, so that took like you know in some cases like 10 minutes, and that makes customers unhappy um, if we can't scale very quick. So um, yeah, when we turned on container image streaming, that took it down to like four to seven seconds. So um, hopefully that that helps. Yeah. Um, but what if the model size is like 70 gig or over 100? Oh. <laughs> so yeah. I can't build a container image, or the registry wouldn't support it. So. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't do any uh, testing in, in, on, on that size. We were more like the, the 10, 7 to 10 gig range, but yeah. I think that um, the startup time of an application like this is actually a critical part, though, of whether it should be in the critical path. So at least at Uber, we do have machine learning models, that are the inference models that are part of the critical flow. And kind of like GK, we, did, we built our own image, uh, built container prefetcher uh, so that we could pull those. But yes, when you get to 70 gigabytes, it does actually, um, what is it? It becomes a question, at least for us right now, of, um, well, do we want to serve this in the core trip flow? What if we need to spring, spring it up, spring up more containers and we can't? Is the core trip flow gonna die? Is that okay? So while we do have, mo so we do actually have models that are like 70 gigabytes, et cetera, but we're only using them right now as part of uh, internal uses. So a great example is uh, we have an LLM and it's connected to all the Google Docs, all Slack, everything, and internal engineers go in there and they might ask it, what you know, what is with this project or et cetera. Um, but we don't use that for the critical part in that because this is a tough thing to solve. And the even tougher part of it to solve is my, en my engineers want um, GPUs to be used at 100% all the time, including during inference, because every GPU that's idle is basically just burning cash. But at our scale, we can't just go to a cloud provider and order more GPUs. We have like a lead time of like over a month if I want more H100s. And so this also kind of ties into this issue with like scaling up and down. So for us really, for models that big, they would be scaled up to the point of like peak load at all times just because 
if I want to scale, I can't, I can't get the extra GPUs to scale it further if I need it. So I have to assume the worst, but yeah. I mean, the, the reason why I was asking this is, if you're building a platform that could uh, serve multiple teams or an organization at large scale, then there may be demands that come in where, you know, hey, we'd, we would like to have this model, and then you would, be, you would want to be able to, you know, uh, build some kind of auto scaling in it. And I, I know it is not ideal to have a 70 gig model, right, uh, being able to auto scale, but there are challenges. So how do you tackle it in production and stuff? That was my area. But I, I think this area is evolving. Uh, but yeah, if, if you have experience, so good. thanks. I mean, I would really question the model. And the use case, right? Uh, so few models require free training. Like, in an enterprise use case. Again, I, I don't know who you're supporting and why and how, but if somebody came to me with that, I'd say, hmm, let's go see what we actually are using. Can we optimize the model down? Can we use the 13 billion parameter version versus the, you know, because often when we first start playing, they're not doing an analysis against precision, yet they're sort of taking an auto, whatever, whatever the default settings were, and they haven't necessarily done a lot of pruning, done a lot of optimization on the model to get to the best configuration for running within the infrastructure. And that's why I came back to availability first. Like, the best solution is the one you can render <laughs> to your users. So if we can come to a place where we understand and do good testing on the precision and the accuracy to prune down the model and into the most optimal fashion, and that gets them a much lower latency, and yeah, maybe we have a little less accuracy, but it's acceptable, that is always going to be easier for us to vend to an end user from rather than trying to make the infrastructure match all the different pet use cases. Uh, again, uh, just following up on that, right? I know there are many others. So uh, the idea is that you know we are not going to have this particular model serve all the requests, but this model could be the interface for for anyone to come and say, hey, okay, I want to do this. From there, it gets routed to the respective smaller models or different use cases that we are building. So in such cases, you would still have you would want to have a situation where you want to have a larger model that has much uh, bigger context or knowledge, and from there you'll be able to divert to a specific model that is serving a specific domain use case and stuff, which is the idea that we are going into, but the challenge that large models bring is how do we scale it across multiple nodes and stuff. But yeah, thanks for your input. Hi, I'm Beth Paris. I'm a reporter from Tech Target. Um, a couple of you mentioned things like DRA and Q. Um, what is on your wish list for the projects that you're using to make it easier to support AI apps on Kubernetes? And any other features that you still want to see or that are still being developed? Shall I go? OK. Yeah, go <laughs> um, I think that right now, one of the toughest things for us is uh, resource scheduling across clusters. Uh, that's why I was at the SIG multi-cluster uh, talk earlier. I think that um, one of the tough things that at least we've seen, especially when we get to very high resource utilization, which is something that actually people want, as I've said many times now, with GPUs, it, it can very much end up being, oh, this cluster is 100% usage, but this one is not. And we don't really have a great story about moving the load between them. We kind of have a, we have a story about this now, at least in Uber, about like, oh, we can rebalance work from this cluster to this cluster. But the tough part about that and the part that kind of makes me sad is that I think everyone has kind of built um, some sort of multi-cluster rebalancer, at least every enterprise of a large size. And we've all just built our own ones. And it's just such a waste of everyone's time that we've had to all go and do this because we could have just built one open source one, like like effectively what happened with Kubernetes, instead of having, uh, you know, probably, what, 10,000 people in like 100 orgs, each who have effectively reinvented the wheel 100 times. But yeah, I think for me, like, being able to, especially now that I'm being asked to like a 100% max out GPUs all the time, being able to do this in a much more smart way through an open source project is something that I would really, really, yeah, want. Yes. Yeah, so definitely plus one that. Um, and this, I, I guess, this kind of transcends the scheduling there potentially, but like a theme that you would maybe notice in a lot of the docs is sort of fault tolerance and failure remediation, right? especially with GPU workloads um, and, and especially with training. Right? So there's a lot of effort going into the space around just how can we make sort of recovering from failures. And to, to what everybody has said here, GPUs are expensive. You want to maximize utilization. You want to drive MFU as high as possible. So you know, right now, it's a lot of cobbling together you know, 
TCG Maxpo, we're trying to get the right metrics out, trying to build the logic to sort of handle failures, right? Trying to, you know, trying to sort of restart from a checkpoint, trying to get your workload scheduled as quickly as possible. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space. I, I think that's where I think making GPU training reliable is, I think, one of the big things for us to solve in 2025 or 2024, I guess. And this kind of ties into uh, another issue that we have more widely, which is um, uh, reske reske rescheduling is effectively uh, a disruptive event. I, w I went to a talk at Rejects, which is the side conference before this, uh, before KubeCon, where they talked about how they were using some hack to use Firecracker so that they could move a task to a, to a new node without it necessarily realizing that it had just been uh, stopped and restarted. That's kind of hacky right now. I think in the next two years, that will probably get into a much more production-ready state. I think that in particular would be particularly useful for training because yes, even today, I have a lot of engineers who'll come to me and be like, oh, your ho I was scheduled on a node and it was a bad host and the host died, you've just lost me two days. And yeah, we, we need a better solution to that. But I think this is gonna be something where I see what, I see people doing work on this, especially things like Firecracker and things that is gonna be useful in the next few years. I just don't think it's ready yet, but in a year or so, watch that space. Next year's next Google. <laughs> I'd also go down a layer and say that, you know, it is incredibly hard to work with most of these GPU vendors. They don't all support the same versions of Linux. They don't all have the same drivers. Some want to force you towards Docker. Some want, it, it is incredibly obnoxious. And I would love to see the GPU vendors put a tenth of the effort into open source as I have seen from the CPU vendors, and that's why everything felt so nice with the commodity world. So it's not just the exporters and the and Chexa and trying to be able to rebuild when a node goes down, which absolutely has to happen. Even just bringing it up, where I've actually felt like I have to come back in my security posture, because to get my Kubernetes cluster up with GPUs in it, I have to roll back to older, bad versions of Linux that have known CVEs. I would never do that. But that is the kind of thing you sometimes have to do when we're working with some very large purple companies. And I find that obnoxious. I just, we have an obligation as an industry to work together. And just because you build your own firmware and you do your own systems and you like to sell your own thing, there is an ecosystem of open source people. We want to work together and we expect you to have good Linux availability. We expect you to play nicely in Kubernetes. We expect you to actually show up. I think Sorry. we can take two more questions. Uh, go ahead, and That's somebody great. else can also go to the microphone. Hi, this is Chen. So I have a quick question about if anyone has run any true multi-tenant applications on GPU in Kubernetes before. The reason why I'm asking this is because, say, like you have two customers, two end users in the same Kubernetes cluster, both can run like pre-training, which is on trusted code. Right, one is able to outbreak out of the container and then temper Kubernetes or temper on the nodes. And the other aspect is that you could do bin packing, right? If you do bin packing on the same node, currently Cloud Provider doesn't give you like the big machine, P5, Mega in GCP and Azure. Um, you can't slice and dice the big machine. You have to do like some sort of Gvisor or Firecracker or Kata, whatever you have to make sure that it is a secure multi-tenant environment. And I know I, it would be great, cloud providers like GCP could slice and dice a bit more, but I just wonder like, multi-tenant, multi-tenancy is always a hard problem in Kubernetes. I think Crusoe may have input. Well, I mean, oh, sorry, Mike's not on. Hey, do you want to, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's still <laughs> like an unsolved problem. I think the, I think this is potentially going to be very interesting in like the serverless GPU space. I think that's, you know, I, I worked at Lambda before and there was sort of Firecracker and that, and that level of multi-tenancy and secure multi-tenancy they were able to do with CPUs. And one of the biggest things that we struggled with when sort of thinking about GPUs as, as a hardware type was really how do we do secure multi-tenancy on it, right? Um, and you know, solutions like MIG, um, like multi-instance GPUs from NVIDIA weren't really, didn't really meet our security bar back then. So I think, Topic of open discussion. Some interesting things that I've seen, like um, like Rani, I don't know if some folks from Rani are in the, in the audience, and time slicing with the GPUs as a way to sort of give you fractional GPU resources. I think a lot of people are investing time and effort in that and allowing you to bin pack GPUs at least within an enterprise or like within a given organization and doing that well. I think I've seen progress there. Um, 
true sort of multi-tenant GPU utilization, at least I think still an unknown to get that into production. I don't know if anybody's actually doing that. Um, I don't know if anybody else has a take on it. There is, see previous answer, there are very proprietary options that exist to do multi-tenancy on a specific GPU, and that is absolutely not something that a lot of the cloud providers want to pay for to that particular hardware vendor to then expose to you as an end user. So time slicing is what I would have recommended. It's the only sort of easy way to go across. The previous older GPUs, you could use grid technologies, and that was exposed in a more open fashion. Um, but there's a very different business model going on today. Uh, we'll take one more question. There's a challenge oh, on sorry. like time. Oh, anyways, maybe we can talk about this offline. But I'm actually oh, we'll, working we'll on like multi-tenancy yeah. on you know GPUs. So this is a very specific like question from me. Uh, we'll, we'll take one more question before they pull us out of here. Go ahead. Really, really quickly, uh, everyone talks about the you know scarcity of hardware, scarcity of money, all that sort of stuff. But what about power? Uh, I manage on-prem data centers, and that's my biggest problem. Yeah, we. Uh, <laughs> I I know that we do have challenges here, and that there is a lot of work on this. However, luckily for me, it is kept far away from me, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't know if uh, you folks on-prem. Structured human. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I would. So. The power of an electron is always going to be a value to the world. Uh, I don't know, you know, I, I won't get poetic. Um, so, unfortunately, I think what you're seeing, maybe from an infrastructure and overall FinOps lens for the way we're managing this, is we're looking for significant increases in efficiency where we can, and recognizing that there's this large space heater that we can't get rid of that is very critical to the business. And so we work to increase the utilization of it. We work to make sure we have excellent methodologies across the sort of feature training solution that we're looking for monitoring of drift across and only retraining when we have to. Like we're trying to optimize from the software lens and also from every other part of the stack, both to free up the capital dollars to invest in this domain, but also to free up the electrons to invest in this domain. I don't want to go out and you know license another 15 megawatts of data centers. That's not my goal, or 25, or, you know, I mean, you can't have a very large array with that. So you really have to think it through and look at how you can balance. I think the other thing is people look at the space heaters that are training systems and think everyone's gonna train and free train. I, I don't know who you are, I love you all, I'd love to have a conversation. We are looking at leveraging models, but training them on our own data, and that is a much smaller compute problem. And so as people are looking at sort of the worst case scenarios, I would also just urge folks to think through, there's usually a much better way of doing it. It's just, you do actually have to call your infrastructure person. Like you have to work across and we need to be working from the software and the bottom up. 